ठीक है मैंने आगे बहुत लोगों को जो है वो पोस्टर भी दिया था वीडियो बुक का है तो सैटरडे के आप करें हाँ हाँ ठीक है तो सबके लिंक है
Okay, uh, good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to weekly astrophysical seminar of Aries. Uh, today, we are very happy to have Professor Dudesh Pipati with us from Ayuka Pune. Uh, Professor Dudesh Pipati has done PhD from Max Planck Institute, Germany, and then he moved to University of Cambridge, UK, and then he joined Ayuka as a faculty. Um, Dudesh worked on uh, diverse fields in solar and heliospheric physics. He, uh, he has worked on corona mass ejections, solar corona jets. Um, and uh, coronal loops as well as MHD waves. So there are many, uh, I mean, his research interest spans uh, uh, many diverse fields. And today he will talk about uh, solar atmosphere and solar wind. And with that, I would like to welcome uh, the to us. Thank you. Can you hear me back there? Yeah? Okay, good afternoon. So. Thank you for uh, the invitation. It's a pleasure to be here. And probably in the last two years, this is my second talk, which is in person, right? So um, that's uh, another highlight. The other one was a bit more different kind of talk. So the first solar talk of this, this uh, uh, season after the pandemic. So it's, um, it's, um, it's a nice thing to do this. Let me say this, that this is probably one of the most difficult talk I had to prepare. The reason is that I was asked to give a colloquium and then uh, I was told that, hey, there is a school going on. So uh, MSc students will be there. So now I had to put something which is useful for you when you are starting, but also I cannot keep other people um, just telling them what the sun look like, but also you have to give them uh, some features, you know? So I have to take it really away that uh, what, uh, the hardcore research we are doing. So, so don't mind if you see that the stock is highly accelerated and, and going in an exponential curve way. Okay. The title here is um, uh, about solar wind and uh, solar atmosphere. And the three phases which I have put already that is hot, is magnetic, and is dynamic. Um, that covers the whole talk. So if you if you really want to go, you can go because now you know everything that I'm going to talk about. Okay. And these um, observations, uh, the, the three animations you see, they are real uh, observations. Uh, the top left there is taken at about, about a million degree. The, the far right one is taken about uh, 30,000 degrees. And the, the one with SST at the middle is the photo experience, which is about 6,000 degrees. So it's going all the way from 6,000 to a million degree. And because this is uh, very important um, and it's challenging and it's interesting and it matters, we uh, from ISRO launching our Tal-1 spacecraft to try to understand that how these different layers of the atmosphere couple and how actually they affect the solar um, atmosphere and heliosphere and space. Trip. Right, so with that, uh, let me go forward and this doesn't like to move. Okay. To put you in perspective, um, there are about 100 billion galaxies in our universe. So probably it was just, uh, just going very fast. You all been introduced to this. And our sun is just one of 100 billion stars in our galaxy. That is the Milky Way. And sun is a rather uh, average star. And we live in a quiet neighborhood far away from the center of the galaxy, right? And if I have to point that where you're located now, where is it is, it would be there, right? Far away, really far away from the galaxy. This galaxy is just a artistic impression uh, of Milky Way uh, because you don't really see Milky Way like this because you see edge on, right? So, so that center here is from the galactic point of view, that's the activity. And probably uh, last week, if you followed news, uh, they did map a black hole at the center of the galaxy, and that is where all the activity is happening. So, for example, Nanital town center and here in that way, or, or take Delhi, for example, and here. So that's the kind of issues you think in terms of activity. And, and if you take all the stars which you uh, uh, observe in Milky Way and put them into a diagram, which is called Hospron, Hospron Russell diagram, and this is a weird plot because Whatever we know that on x-axis things go from left to right and y go from bottom to top, 
here the temperature goes higher from right to the left. And, and then you see that the temperature is increasing all, going all the way up to 30,000 degrees and the luminosity goes uh, up. And you put all these stars together, what you find that most of the stars you observe, they fall on this line, which is, which is the, the main sequence. And then other, other blocks here, like white dwarfs, supergiants, and all, they're just telling you the different stages of life of different stars. Now, when we have to point where the sun is, then you find that that is the location where uh, your sun is. That means that it's nothing really a special star when you think in terms of other still stars in the Milky Way, but it has a different meaning for us because it's just a life provider uh, to, to us. And that is why it is much more important to study. The second point is that it is so close that uh, we can observe it very, very close and we can study in best possible way. And I put understood there in quotations that more you study does not mean that you really more understand it. And there was, there was a talk by a really famous person and he was talking about various stars and, and people said, well, if that is really true, then we should be observing this thing for the sun as well. And the guy said, we understand other stars better than the sun because the sun's observation is so detailed, so close, that it's really, really difficult to interpret and put theoretical perspective to everything we see uh, in the solar atmosphere. Now, whatever we know about the sun so far, it's just put into this diagram. Okay. So, so we know that there is a uh, there is a core at the center of the sun where you're producing most of the synergy because the hydrogen burning. Then you have the radiative zone, and then you have the convective zone. And and how why does the convection start? You should read up, but essentially the the temperature gradient falls so sharply that these photons are the, the, the light which is radiated, it cannot bring the energy and therefore it becomes a convective uh, unstable and you start seeing convective convection cells. And that is what you see on the photosphere at this location here. So that is, that is the photosphere. And on the photosphere, you see various structures like sunspots. And then if you look at the sunspots, you see umbra, penumbra and so on. And then you go higher up into the atmosphere, you have a chromosphere, transition region and the corona, and eventually solar wind and helios, which I'll uh, get into in a bit of detail in the talk. Now, sun, when you start observing it, what you figure that it essentially has two different phases, which is quite unique, right? One, the left image is taken in 2001, where you see that there are a number of dark spots on the surface, whereas on the right-hand side, you see that there are essentially no spots, right? And that is during solar maximum, the 2001, and 2005 is during solar minimum. And what we find that it is not that in 2001, we had those many sunspots and then there was nothing going on and, and so on. If you look at all these sunspots and count every day that how actually they vary, what you essentially find that there is a cyclic behavior when at some point you have no sunspots and the number of sunspots start to increase, they go to a highest level and then they start to decrease. And that happens over a period of another year. And that is what is called the sunspot cycle. Okay. If you take this image, and, and thanks to Zeeman and, and Hale, who could measure magnetic field at each point, what they found was those are the regions, those dark spots, they are strongest in magnetic field. Right? And that is why they are dark, because when you have a strong magnetic field, it quenches the convection because the, the energy which is coming out with the plasma parcel is stopped or quenched by the strong magnetic field. And therefore you don't see density and temperature. And that is why they look darker. And when you measure at each point, then you find that it's not only those dark spots which are magnetic, which you see on the right-hand side. So that's a magnetic field measurement at each point, but the whole surface is magnetic, right? You don't see this in this image uh, around here, for example, it's, it looks completely gray, but here you see it is white and dark. And the white here tells you there's a magnetic field going out of the sun and the dark is going inside the sun. So what you find that, of course, these regions here, they have a stronger magnetic field. So the stronger the darkness here and the brightness here is stronger is the magnetic field, but you also have magnetic field where there is no uh, sun space. When you do it better, you find that the sun is like a pizza with salt and paper on top of it, right? 
So these are uh, uh, image sequences, measured magnetic field maps and put together for a month. What you find that there are two belts where you have the stronger magnetic field in the two uh, hemisphere and rest of the sun is just filled with dark and uh, white patches, um, uh, which are also a small scale magnetic field. Now what you do is similarly like what you did, you count the sunspots. You can do the same thing here. You look at these magnetic fields and take, a, I mean, there are techniques to look into the center meridian part and put them together for so many years. What you essentially find is like, The, the top one is just the number of sunspots plotted with the coordinate system. So you define the equator as zero, go to plus 90 and minus 90. You see this butterfly diagram and that changes about roughly about 11 years. But if you do that with the magnetic field, what you find, what you find is in, in 75, you look at that. So the pole, the North Pole is yellow and the South Pole is blue. And that changes after 11 years. So in 85, 86, you have changed it completely. So the North has become blue and South has become yellow. And what you also see is, yeah, they just sit here. Um, what you also see is that around here towards the equator, this yellow is migrating towards the pole, uh, towards the equator, and here the blue, and they're canceling each other out. Whereas here, this yellow is canceling the, um, the blue is canceling yellow and converting that into to blue. So every 11 years, you are essentially flipping the polarity of the sun, and that is what is called the magnetic. Uh, magnetic cycle. And that happens why it is 22 years because the yellow becomes yellow in about 22 years. So if somebody tells you 11 year solar cycle and 22 years, essentially the same thing. One is with sunspot, the other is with magnetic field. Now, this is the sun, uh, image of the sun when you look at it from ground. And if you use any specific filter, here is uh, H alpha then you start seeing something called uh, the chromosphere uh, because it's a chromo, a chromo is uh, red and deep. And what you start seeing is there are various other structures like those like sunspots, but also you see start seeing these uh, dark filament regions and they are essential part or integral part of the chromosphere structure. You see them all the time. What you also see from ground is when the moon comes and blocks the photosphere, and you start seeing this uh, magnificent crown of the sun that is called the Perona. What you are seeing here, there are structures. They're really long, elongated structures. And you have these um, structures which are going out into the heliosphere and, and we call them open field structures or, or plumes. These structures are nothing but density and magnetic field representation. So electron density and magnetic field representation in the corona. And why it is that? Because I'll tell you in next slides or so that the corona is fully ionized. So you have a lot of free electrons and you have these photons from the photosphere. That's the light you receive here. It's just passing through those free electrons and getting scattered. Right? And the scattering is Thomson scattering, so they don't change the frequency, they just change the, the direction. And since these elect free electrons are there, they are fully trapped into magnetic field. So all these structures you see, they are representing magnetic field and trapped electrons, so the electron density map. So, so the solar eclipse gives you a lot of important information uh, uh, about how the distance density, electron density is distributed and how his magnetic field is distributed. And that is how we conclude that these structures here, they are open field structures. And so they are the poles and you cannot have monopoles anywhere. So these have to come and, and close with each other. And that is why they're really, really going far away and they're bringing solar wind into the heliosphere. And if they are as far, uh, as large as, one AU, for example, then they can produce 
or array, right? So uh, those are that. Now there have been ah this is solar eclipse image. So during one of the solar eclipses, this was taken. Maybe I should have put in the eclipse image which uh, we took in Argentina uh, eclipse. But but I find this one is much more. The field of view is much larger, so it's much better. But uh, so during one of the eclipses in uh, 1869 or so, these two scientists, Harkness and Young, they uh, wanted to study the gas, the property of the gas they're observing into the corona. And to study property of any kind of gas, all you do is spectroscopy. So they wanted to do spectroscopy. And they started to observe one of these lines, a green line. Uh, 10 years before that, there was another study where they had discovered helium because they started observing a new line and uh, they didn't find any element corresponding to that in the periodic table. So they called it helium because it was originating from the sun. So they started calling this coronium because it was observed from the corona. But it turned out that, um, and it took only about 60 years, right? In 1930s, that these lines are not due to any new element, but essentially because of the very high ionization of the elements such as iron and calcium, right? So imagine that you need, how much energy you need for taking away one electron from hydrogen, right? So imagine that if you have to take 14 or 13 electrons out from iron, how much energy you would need and that would correspond to roughly a gas with a temperature of more than a billion degree, right? So that puts you in a problem, is that when you observe this photosphere, and I didn't tell you how it was the temperature of photosphere, because you all know it's 6,000 degrees, and you do that also by spectroscopy, but less resolution is just do the Planck spectroscopy and fit that with Planck function. So the, the radiation you're receiving from the sun to, to earth, that is coming from about 6,000 degrees. But when you're going outside into the atmosphere, you're measuring it to be about a million degrees, right? And that is what is a major puzzle, which is called the solar coronal heating problem. Now we know that if you create such a plot where you have height on the x-axis and temperature here is shown on the left, right, left y and mass density on the left, uh, right y-axis, and here is the photosphere, chromosphere, transition the corona, respective height here. But you find that, of course, when you go away from the sun, the temperature starts, uh, keeps decreasing. It goes to temperature minimum, but then at a certain location, it starts to increase. And that is where the chromosphere starts. And suddenly in about, after about a thousand kilometers, you go from 10,000 degrees to about a million degrees. And, and that happens in the transition region. And, and then in the corona, you reach all the way up to three to five million degrees. What you also see is that the density falls off sharply, of course, still here, but even sharper, the decreases in the transition region and in the corona. The left part here, uh, up to chromosphere, you can observe that by visible and, and UV, but for going for the transition region and x-rays, you have to, um, transition in the corona, you have to go for EUV and x-ray. However, you do observe the eclipses in white light, right? And that is because the Thomson scatter light you observe, right? So there's a photospheric photons you're observing as a scattered light. Also, you can observe corona in visible if you start taking the forbidden transitions for the item 13 Nine and ten lines, and that is what one of the uh, instruments on our detail one is going to make use of. And those are easier lines to observe because they're really far away, so they don't have much blending. And that's why one can make use of those lines to do better spectroscopy in the corona. Now, considering that uh, you have all these radiation coming from from the atmosphere, starting from visible all the way to, to X-ray. If you look at the solar radiation spectrum, this is what you observe, right? So on x-axis, you have wavelength, and y-axis, you have irradiance, which is in milliwatt per meter square per nanometer. That is what 
beyond this, 310 or something. Uh, beyond this, you get at all. And to observe anything from UV and beyond towards X-ray, you have to go to space. Okay? Because that is what is blocked by our uh, atmosphere. This also 310, you have to be very lucky, very, very clear whether you can observe that to really high mountain, but that's not easily possible. So, so to this region here, because X-ray and UV and EUV, because it is absorbed by our atmosphere, Earth's atmosphere, it governs the dynamics of the Earth's atmosphere. So, of course, you have to, uh, the first question is that how X-ray and UV radiation is created, but then you also have to look at its variation and its effect into the Earth's atmosphere. So it's essentially you are talking about a coupled system in the way the, how does the sun's radiation affect the dynamics into the Earth's atmosphere. Okay. Now, people are always extreme and physicists particularly. If you look at this curve, because the temperature and density changes very extreme, very highly extremely over there in the transition region, we wanted to observe that for a very, very long time. And that is what has been done here, right? So about 50,000 and above, you have so many data points. All of them are not covered here because there are a lot of other spectral uh, information. But the height you are covering from photosphere all the way to the chromosphere is about 2,500 kilometers. Whereas that one is only about 100 kilometers to, to about a thousand kilometers maybe. But the number of data points are very limited, right? And that is why this region is very important to cover. And that is, I'll, I'll show you that what we're doing with this, with Aditya. But what you realize here is if you compare this, so this is your photosphere. That is the magnetic field map, and that is X-ray uh, image. And, and they are taken nearly simultaneously, maybe within a few minutes. What you find is that the atmosphere is highly structured, right? It's not just so, so the structures at each location you find. The other thing you find is that wherever you have the stronger magnetic field, so if you look at this location here, the brightness into different images are correlated with the location of the strong magnetic field. And we know, and probably Professor Banerjee would have talked to you or will talk to you how the magnetic field is generated and the long-term effects of it, that it's generated deep down inside the sun by dynamo. The whole atmosphere is coupled from inside out all the way into the corona, but also into the heliosphere because that's where the magnetic field is going all the way and connecting into the solar wind. But since these images can be taken very fast because sun is close by, you can also look at not only the static frames, but also their dynamics, right? Because it's if you keep taking images, you make a movie, right? You can make a movie from your uh, phone, for example. And, and that is what is done here. So in the top left, you have the photosphere that those are the, the granules, the bringing the energy and the, the dark here is the plasma is just cooling and going down. Uh, the bottom here is in the chromosphere and that's what one of the first images was there. We show that. And then top right, you have, um, three filter images of a solar flare. So the large eruption and then all put together uh, in three different colors. So three different colors means three different temperatures and they're observing ultraviolet. Does ultraviolet have color? So they are fake colors essentially, right? Just to, just to make you see that what those uh, colors would be. And we know that there the temperature could be as large as 20 to 30 million degrees. Um, if you, if you go even further for, for other structures, so in the top here, you see there are uh, regions. So those are the regions where you have a strong field, as you could see in the equator, uh, above the equator. 
And you have the structures which are evolving at time scales of uh, minutes to, to, to seconds even. Um, in the bottom right, you see that there is a big material which is just erupting and, and that will produce coronal mass ejections if you, if you know what they are. Um, engulfing the whole heliosphere with, with, uh, with charged particles. And if I have to compare what the size of Earth in comparison to this is, so there are put on a scale, right? So the good thing is that the, the space between sun and earth is so vast that uh, that expands and therefore you only get a tiny bit of it. And if it you get it with the right magnetic field orientation, then you have fun. And, and the bottom left here is a coronagraph image from Soho Lasco. And that is nothing but eclipsing. So you, So this is your sun. And you create an eclipse by using an artificial uh, occulture so that you will start observing the outer region because the intensity falls up very sharply. So if you don't block it, then you won't see what is going on outside. And, and you see that the whole heliosphere is, is much, much, much uh, dynamic uh, and, and active. Now, these eruptions, which you call them coronal mass ejection, they are also very nicely correlated with the way the magnetic field goes and also the way the corona goes and uh, it, it evolves. So for example, here in 2000, 1997, the sun was in minimum. So it could have been somewhere around here when there was very little magnetic field. And if you just count the number of eruptions it's taking, it could be one in two days or so. But if you look into maximum, you could have as many as 10 eruptions in a, in a day. Um, if the number has been devised now, I don't know. Yes, okay. around 10. Um, if you look at uh, what the, the upper atmosphere of the sun is doing, so, so here is solar maximum when you have the strongest magnetic field and you have the largest amount of uh, radiation in X ray. And when there is no X ray, you see there is um, almost no concentration of magnetic field. Uh, but of course, magnetic field is there, and that's why. There is always a little bit of X-ray coming in, but not those uh, localized strong X-ray um, I showed you this map, but I wanted to uh, tell you that this region here, very tiny uh, height, and you have many, many data points, whereas this region here, which is about 2,000 kilometers, we have only uh, two data points and maybe we can three. Now there are more, but a smaller field of view, and that is what we will cover with adding uh, 11 data points from one of the instruments on the PL1 uh, to provide a, a comprehensive coverage of, as you know now, I hope that I've convinced you that everything is coupled, so you need to look at the variations at every height and how do they transport mass and energy. Now, the radiation which is, which is coming from this region in the, in the top left here, um, they, are, they are this part here, right? So, so 200 to about 400. They are coming all the way to the stratosphere. With X ray, extreme X ray, and far UV, they are stopped in the thermosphere and mesosphere. But these ones are much more important because they come to the stratosphere and that is full of oxygen and ozone. And that changes these photons in ultraviolet, they work as a catalyst for changing ozone and oxygen dynamics. And therefore you could have um, uh, effects which, are, which could be very severe. And that is what it's going to, uh, suit is going to be, one of the instruments we're going to be looking at uh, in detail. The other space weather effect it could have is like when you, when you look at the Earth's atmosphere and its temperature really between minimum and maximum, because of this radiation, which is absorbed by the Earth's atmosphere, the temperature changes in the atmosphere of the Earth by about 400 Kelvin. Now, Earth's atmosphere is gaseous, you know, and you put more energy, it is going to expand. You take away energy, it is going to shrink. By solar minimum and solar maximum, you are going to do that, increase and reduce, uh, enhance and reduce the, the amount of radiation you're putting in. And thereby, if you put a satellite, which is just floating, then it, the, the shrinking and expansion of the atmosphere is going to produce a lot of drag effects. And therefore you have to always put in more energy to balance those satellites 
and that is one of the most important aspects to the effect the solar radiation uh, creates. Also, unless you don't know how much is the total variation and how much is the total uh, high energy flux coming from the sun, you don't really know how high in the atmosphere its, its effect is going to be. So there is no hard boundary of the Earth's atmosphere finishing, right? So you need to really understand the sun's radiation, radiation and its dynamics to essentially control all your uh, space with the satellites. And, and why is that important also? Because this I told you, and you also know that the sun's radiation is not changing by, by much, it's only 0.1%. But what changes is the high energy, the, the ultraviolet and X-ray. And here, if you look at this, so this is a wavelength, this is the relative contribution. If you look at the red curve here, and this is 400 nanometers because beyond 400, almost everything you can observe here. And what happens is this energy contained is only 8% of the total energy contained in the solar radiation. But if you look at the relative changes, this change is very, very tiny, whereas this change from minimum to maximum is about 60%, right? So the Earth atmosphere is absorbing radiation, which is changing from minimum to maximum by 60%. Therefore, you need to characterize it better to understand the space weather effects. Now, when you look at the, the structure of the sun and you take an X-ray image, what you find is that there are these very bright regions and they are forming in the, in the belt where you have this strong magnetic field appearing and we call them active regions. Then you also have these really dark regions. They are forming uh, during solar minimum at, at, the, at the poles, we call them coronal holes, because they look like holes. It's not a hole, it just looks darker and therefore it looks like that. And then in addition, you have quiet sun, which I think I showed you that it's not so quiet because everything is, everything is so dynamic. And on top of that, you have this continuous streaming of particles from these uh, coronal holes, for example. Right? So these are the coronal holes region from the two poles. And that is where, if you look at the magnetic field, uh, the eclipse images, for example, those structures were just opening out. And those were the one connecting in the heliosphere. What is shown here is, like since you can measure magnetic field at each point in the photosphere, in a very layman way, what you could do is you can use those points with salt and pepper as two polarity of the magnetic field, and you can draw lines of forces. So that is essentially in a very lame angle. It's not as simple as that. You can draw these lines of forces. So you see many of them are closing, but the ones which are coming from the poles, they're opening up. And these are the ones which are appearing as plume-like structure in the, in the eclipse images, right? Because they are the magnetic field, the high energy uh, fully charged particles are, are trapped in these three electrons and they are shown as white because the photosphere lights are scattered. Now, what you do is you see that in the heliosphere, there is always some particles are coming in with different speeds. There was a satellite called Ulysses, which went around in an orbit, very interesting orbit, uh, which covered the, the ecliptic plane of sun. What they found was that when you were going away towards the pole, right? So, this is a specific plot. So, so these ones here, they're showing the fluctuation in the velocity they measure. This one would be about 800 kilometers per second. So this is the x-axis and y-axis, both are velocities, or speed if you like. What they find is that near the equator, the speeds are really small, which is about 300 kilometers per second. But when they were going towards the pole, then you could observe all the way up to 800 kilometers per second. And that is what your solar wind, which is coming out due to uh, the past ones, due to the open field lines. Although there are much more detailed studies now, and it's not really clear. Uh, there is no consensus yet that where is the fast wind coming from and where is the slow wind coming from. But this is this is earlier study where there is a clear cut signature that at least the past ones would be coming due to the open field structures because there is nothing stopping them; they're just getting accelerated. And if you want to know more about how these ones are getting accelerated, 
Dr. Professor Banerjee. Um, then you have these uh, slow solar wind here, and they are sort of understood to be ejected because a lot of dynamic phenomena of different magnetic field going on, which is reconnecting and throwing away the particles, and that might get lead to another acceleration, which will give you these slow solar wind. And, and to study everything, including how the, uh, the corona is measured, the coronal magnetic field is measured, and how the solar wind is measured, and the solar radiation in the, in the range, which is affecting the stratosphere, Aditya uh, one is designed with several instruments, which will be launched now in January 23. Uh, one of the instruments we're building at Ayuka. The whole science support cell is going to be stationed here. So, so if you end up doing PhD in solar physics, then this is the place you want to, to get hold of, to get trained on and analyzing your data. Um, it is going to be at the arrow point, which is between sun and earth. What happened at L2 recently, do you know? JWST went, they don't like sun, they want to block it, so they went to L2. But we don't uh, mind that, so we went to L. We will go to L1, and the nice thing is that you have 24/7 observation from L1 point without any eclipse, and I'll cover all the way from X-ray to infrared from the same space point. And let's go uh, dive deeper into uh, this and look at the problem of solar coronal heating and see if we can integrate what we know about solar coronal heating and how we we produce uh, solar wind. How much time do I have, Bible? Okay. Right, so I showed you this image and what you see that there is Activision, Poisson, and coronal hole. If you look at, so, so if you want to understand the coronal heating problem, ask, we ask the question in a different way. If anything is radiating energy, then you need to understand that what is powering that much in one of the Saying corona is a million degree, fine. But how much energy is releasing? How much energy it is losing? We know that the total energy loss from regions like this, because it's really, really bright, so it's radiating more. So that is about 10 to 7 Earths per centimeter square per second. If you look at the quartz on and corona holes, they are releasing up to about 10 to 5, radiating about 10 to 5 Earths per centimeter square per second, right? Since we know that the lifetime, quiet sun and coronal holes are always there. Coronal holes are lifetime about a month or sometimes two to three months. Activisions, they are function of solar activity, but a given activision can last for a few days and sometimes about one or two solar rotations. And one rotation is about 27 days. So, to explain this, that how much, how, how do they release this? You need to really find a way to understand that how, how do you put in so much of energy continuously to sustain that kind of radiation? And that is quantitative way of asking this question about coronal heat. Even if there is no active region, sun is losing 10 to 5 volts per centimeter square per second because quiet sun is always there. Uh, okay, the second thing is that electron density. So if you measure electron density, in FT region, you have over 10 to the power 10, in coronal hole 10 to the power 7, and here you have in the choir 10 to the power 8. The question is that in quiet sun region, or solar minimum, you have this quiet sun, right? And density is 10 to the power 8. What happens then when you start putting more magnetic field, what happens that you start getting much more density? Where does the mass come from, right? So the mass has to come from somewhere down where there is mass, right? So the reservoir has to be there. And that is what is, is, the, is the, the physics of transporting the heat, energy and mass from the lower atmosphere where the reservoir is into the upper atmosphere to get to a density of 10 per 10, uh, 10 per 10 uh, centimeter cube. As I've showed you earlier. Okay. So how do you go about it? So you, to really understand this uh, energy loss, 
you really need to figure out what the energy source is. You need to figure out that you know, having source is not enough. You have to transport that energy as well as the mass. The energy transport might be in a different way, right? Or a different, uh, um, not different way. Different type of energy you have to be transporting, maybe magnetic energy you are transporting, but that does not really mean heating, right? So you have to convert that energy into heat, right? Once you do that, then what will happen? So th these are three things you need to find. Once you do that, convert that into heating, then you have gas, plasma, the plasma will essentially respond to it. Plasma respond to it, it will give you radiation. And once you have the radiation, then that's what you will observe, right? So if you point a telescope, what you're essentially seeing is this, right? So if you're a theoretician, you will go from top to down, right? You will identify the, and look at the heating mechanism, and then you try to see what observables are coming, and then you compare with observations, right? And if you're an observer, then you will see this, Transport it. So, yeah, so there is no hydrogen because the temperature is so high that it's fully ionized. Only there's no hydrogen, there's only ionized uh, higher elements and free electrons. Okay. Calcium, iron, silicon, oxygen, whatever you find on Earth, it mostly is there. That's why we are uh, still on the table, right? Okay. So if you're an observer, you go from bottom, you observe, then you try to figure out what kind of radiation it is and what kind of plasma response would have been and so on. And that is where you have to handshake with theoreticians to exactly figure out that what's happening in the atmosphere. We know, and I have been, I hope that I've convinced you that the energy source is nothing but magnetic, right? Because Every such a nice correlation you get, and you see the dynamics of the magnetic field, then it has to be magnetic field. Energy transport, there are various ways you can transport energy. It could be just like um, taking rubber band and twisting, you're putting energy into it, and twist is just propagating. Or you could have waves, right? So, because you have this convection, and the magnetic field is rooted there, these convections are creating disturbances, and the waves are propagating upwards, and those could be transporting energy as well. But these Twisting and tangling and the waves, they are not bringing energy which can heat right away, right? So they have to be converted into heating and that is what the conversion mechanism is. And that is then the core of the, from the theoretical perspective, that's the core of how actually you convert these, uh, the heating uh, mechanism. And you can talk to Weber about that, about mostly about the wave, uh, wave conversion into different kind of uh, magnetic topologies. Now, one way of doing it, and I, I already told you that it could be. Surface of the sun. Yeah. So hydrogen is there. That's how you see uh, hydrogen alpha line, right? So they are there in the chromosphere. But when you go up into the in the corona, exactly. So what happens, and I, I think I'll come to it, is that the evaporation flows, which essentially brings the mass from the chromosphere up into the corona, the ionization happens before the evaporation takes place. So the first the plasma gets ionized, and then it simply splits up. Otherwise, if you the density is so large that if you only consider, not even the line formation amount, if you only consider very strong radiation, then any energy you put in, it will be just lost because just by very strong radiation. So it won't see any sort of upflows and so on. So the temperature, so the heating input you are putting in, it has to be on a really short time scale and it has to be large enough that the plasma is start to respond. And in that process, the whole thing just gets analyzed. Really impulsive, very impulsive. Exactly. Yeah. Right. So I, I showed you already this. Uh, let me see if it runs. Yeah. So so now again, this is real observation. 
you have these convection cells and these tiny white ones here, they are the traces of magnetic field. And what you're doing is because of the movements, you're suffering these field lines. And, and Parker proposed that, which if you have these loop, two magnetic fields and are rooted at these two locations, and only one of them is moving around, then you see it will create a lot of tangling, right? And tangling means that you could have current sheets forming in between different flux tubes. And if you have the current sheet, then on a very short uh, length scales, you could get to your diffusion length scale. And there you might relieve the distresses which are building up into these uh, magnetic fields. But also, as I said, that these disturbances will produce waves and, and these waves can travel along the magnetic field. They can bring energy up into the, in the corona. And now we know that is it's not so black and white and both of them are there. Which one is dominant where is, is a question and how dominant is there. But having said that, does the energetic work out? Now, if you really have to look at the energetics of this, then what you need to do is you really need to work out that by doing this mechanical work, by the movement of these convection cells on the magnetic field, how much energy is transported, right? And the energy is transported is nothing but just the point in flux. And that you can work out by the, uh, the vertical and horizontal component of the magnetic field and the horizontal movement, which is getting created. And that will give you the sort of stresses or any of the waves. Right, so so you can we have measurements of dv dh as well as vh. So you can work out how much total energy is there just by that uh, mechanical work. And what turns out is these we can measure. So typical local speed is one kilometer per second. In the quiet sun is considering one percent of the filling factor. You have ten gauss and fifty percent filling factor is is about five hundred gauss. If you take that into account. For quiet sun and coronal hole, you get total energy is about 2.5 in 10 to 7 hours, which is two hours of magnitude larger than what you really need to explain the radiation from, coronal, uh, from quiet sun and coronal hole. And here it is about 20 to the power 9, is also in about two hours of magnitude larger than you need to explain the, the heating from that region. As I'm just putting here. So this mechanical work. The amount of energy supplies to the magnetic field to bring it up is, is much larger than it's sensibly need, right? So that source thing is, is proven that that, that, is the, that is the source of the energy which has to be transported up into the atmosphere. Now, as I said, there are two different ways. One is twisting and tangling, and the other is, uh, for example, due to waves. Yeah. What you see is you have the, the, it all depends on how fast the, you know, the, the movement is and how fast it is getting transported. So if it is larger than the alphanic time, then it is because of twisting and tangling because the motion has, is really slow. And if it is motion is really fast, that is smaller than the alphanic uh, time, then you have wave heating and it's going all the way into the wave. As you can see here, the, the loops which are continuously changing, the time scale is really, really sharp, right? So the way to explain it, that you might have uh, different heating events going on because of the twisting and tangling, uh, which is creating the current sheets, right? So it could be larger event and smaller event and so on. And, and, and looking at these observations, we find that this is not one particular loop, but we have many, many, many loops. So that is easy to produce these kind of twisting, tangling, and current sheets, and therefore you can you can try to explain uh, by doing this uh, modeling, which we call the nano flare. And if that the time difference between two heating events is larger than the cooling time, then you have really high impulsive heating, and then let's see cool down. Otherwise, it's just a steady heating. They always keep putting energy, and it just keeps maintaining its temperature and other properties. And what we find is that most of the structures which we see of this kind uh, in, the, in the corona, they can be explained by uh, impulsive heating, whereby you have the time scale uh, of the events between two, two events is, is, is uh, larger than the cooling time. Therefore, the plasma is just heating evaporated. 
and then cooling down, and that's all measurements uh, you see. Um, but the question we're asking is that we can explain these loops by impulsive heating. How about the quiet zone? We don't see any structure. There is a quiet patch of region which is already radiating in a million degree. And also, how do you actually form? Because if you see the, the energy lost from the coronal hole where the solar wind is coming from and the quiet sun where the, there is, there's only heating, the total energy loss is the same, 10 to 5 hours, right? So can we put in this together and try to see if we can uh, explain the quiet sun heating as well as the coronal, um, the formation of solar wind in a single mechanism? And since I don't have time, that's why I said it has to be really going fast. But what you see here is that's your photosphere, which you observe from ground. And that is your corona, where you have these coronal holes, really dark. But if you look into the intermediate level, which is at the chromosphere, you see these ones are really nicely identified, which are the active regions. But if you take this region here, which would be around this, and take this region here, which is around this, apart from the limb darkening, and which you'll learn more about, and, and that can be corrected for, there is no difference in the structure you see here, in the structure you see here on these large scales. Uh, so then what is happening that in the higher scales you have those coronal holes are forming and you don't see that in, in, the, in the lower one. Even in the magnetic field, you see these magnetic fields nicely replicated here, right? So these are the regions which you see actually in the, this, but here, which is be here and, and take this region and this region, there is essentially no difference in the way the magnetic field is distributed, right? So there is something happening at some particular height within that range, which is creating quiet sun and creating coronal hole. Um, I wouldn't go into this, which is unfair because a lot of people have done a lot of work on this, but to tell you that what we've done is when you look at uh, these structures, so for example, here, One of the observations. So this part here is coronal hole and this part here is quiet sun. Okay. If you look into transition region, if I didn't tell you that this corresponds to this and this corresponds to this, you would not be able to say that which part is which. Right? It's all it's all the same. But when you uh, even if you look at the magnetic field, this part is this, this part is this, but if I didn't draw this line then you won't be able to say which part is belonging to which region, right? So the magnetic field is same on the larger scale. The intensity images are same in the transition region in the, tone, uh, in the tone sphere. So what actually makes a difference? When the difference is start to come out, when you actually start looking for different magnetic field elements, right? So if you take 10 Gauss field here and 10 Gauss field there, and you look at the intensity, we start seeing differences. It does not get replicated in the images, but what we plotted here is the magnetic field versus intensity. This belongs to quiet sun, this belongs to coronal hole. So for the same magnetic field, so you get all the Tony Gauss magnetic field here, look at the difference in the intensities. You see that the intensity is replicated for individual magnetic flux tubes. And that also appears in, when you look into the Doppler shift, so this is for uh, quiet sun, this is for coronal hole. And, and what you see is that the quiet sun is much more restricted in the coronal holes uh, than the coronal holes. If you look at the non thermal velocity, essentially there is no difference. And non thermal velocity is telling you the, the processes which is going on uh, to help release the energy, for example, which could be magnetic deconnection, for example. So that tells you that although the, for the same magnetic field, you start seeing the differences in the velocity and intensity, the processes which is going on is probably very similar into those regions. Um, if you start looking into a bit more detailed and you, you separate out the red shift and blue shift, red shift means the plasma is going towards the sun and blue shift is plasma going away, and that is the solar wind. What you see the red shift is the the coronal holes are this one here, it's less redshifted than the quiet sun. 
But if you look at the, the blue shift, what you find that is, although the quiet sun is not showing much of a blue shift, the coronal hole is more blue shifted than the quiet sun for the same magnetic flux. So if you have a 20 Gauss flux in quiet sun and in the coronal hole, it is more red sh blue shifted in the coronal hole because it's giving you already the sources of the, um, uh, of the solar wind uh, already in there. So, so quickly, how do we put in all these uh, things together? And what we found from earlier work, and we are, we are at the moment revising it with better data, is that when you look into the coronal hole in quiet sun, what you find that in quiet sun, you have large number of closed field lines and larger ones, where in the coronal hole, you have the shorter number of closed field lines. And the field lines are starting to open up because if you look at the magnetic field distribution is all the same, right? So what is happening in, uh, let me just go to this. What is happening in, in, in these two topologies then, then in the coronal hole, you have the shorter fields and very less uh, longer fields. And also you have the canopy, which is opening up the field lines. But in the quiet sun, you only have these close field lines at different distances. So you just, all you're doing is just combining uh, uh, reconnecting these different field lines uh, together and plasma is just getting redistributed from one field line to other. There's no way for it to escape. Whereas in this topology here, you have this magnetic flux, which is open and this is closed. So if you reconnect this one with this one, then you'll open a field line like that and this will create a closed field line over there. So the closed one, Will replicate the, the blue shift and this open one will replicate the replicate the red shift and the blue one replicate the blue shift which is taking away the plasma up into the uh, sphere and that will power uh, solar wind and and that is this mechanism is nothing but essentially reconnection which also was um, uh, validated for the closed field uh, uh, active region uh, coronal heating. So of course, this is not the end of it. You have to, this is just a scenario. It has to be proven by further observations and simulations and forward modeling and so on. So with that, yeah, thank you very much. Okay. For a very nice overview on sun and solar wind. So now we have time for questions. Yeah. Uh, sir, uh, during solar maxima and solar minima of sunspot, uh, and the, at the uh, sun poles, there were always uh, open field lines were seen. So does the sun has a under, I mean, uh, a general magnetic field structure like a dipole magnet and on the active regions, there are uh, spontaneous magnetic field occurring. Is it like that or uh, something else kind of magnetic field structure is there? Right, so um, maybe I can say it that clearly. During solar minimum, the, the coronal holes, right, the darker regions, they are localized towards the poles. And as the solar activity increases, the magnetic field starts to pop up and they pop up within the equatorial belt, you know, plus minus 60 degrees in the, in the latitude. And that is what defines what you see in the equatorial belt. And when the magnetic field is evolving, they go through all these kind of processes and keep changing the topologies and, and creating the sporadic uh, eruptions like large scales, small scales, and uh, almost at all scales, which can imagine. As the sun evolves with the with the solar cycle, these coronal holes, which are at the poles, they are not localized anymore towards the pole only. They can also move all the way towards the equator, right? So that that is also changing the equatorial uh, structures. When you see if there is a coronal hole, then you will see a different structure. So. Uh, is it a magnetic field uh, cycle, 22 year cycle, that magnetic field switches? Is it related to that one? Like uh, you showed that magnetic field. Uh, exactly. Okay. Yeah, that exactly. Any other questions? Yeah. Uh, yes. Rising but in the chromosphere region, there is a density profile which is increasing continuously, but the 
the temperature is almost constant at that temperature. So why is this so? Because uh, at a particular time in the coronal region, it is decreasing and increasing, but here the density is decreasing, but the temperature is uh, constant. Why is this? This cold. Yeah. This cold. In the chromosphere region, the yeah. temperature is almost constant, but the density is continuously decreasing. Density is continuously decreasing because you are go going away in the atmosphere, right? Yeah. So the density is decreasing yeah. because the mass is less and less. Yeah, but uh, why is this temperature? We don't know. Maybe, maybe it's just the waves. You want to comment? No, actually, uh, I think he's looking at everything in terms of a thermal heating. It is not thermal. It's not thermal. So the heating is mostly due to the non thermal processes. So as you rightly said, if it would have been only thermal processes, then it should have been related to directly to density. But the heating uh, of the, so that way, if it would have been only thermal, then the temperature would have dropped down all the way. Huh? So temperature is maintained because of some additional energy supply through non-thermal processes. So now, which kind of non-thermal processes are dominant in which high dictates the amount of heat. So it appears that, uh, you know, uh, a lot of ionization and all that also happens in the chromosphere, but this transition region uh, leads to a lot of these other additional processes of, you know, reconnection and like waves and so on. And then again, presence of wave is not enough. You have to convert that wave energy into the form of heat. So that heating happens into more into higher heights uh, in the transition region adequately. Then again, there is a sort of, you know, equilibrium that, you know, if, uh, the corona temperature is maintained to a very high, uh, you know, high level for a very large distances. So it's all non-thermal processes, it's not thermal processes which are responsible for the temperature. Sir, I have another question regarding, uh, here you have shown different um, distance of the sun in different different wavelengths, which in X-rays or figures and UV. So uh, in all the figures, we can see uh, some uh, magnetic fields uh, and the uh, uh, all the field lines, how it is developed, and all these things. So, what kind of different pictures we can see in different different wavelengths, maybe in optical, UV, or X rays? That's what I think we showed. No, that's what you see at different wavelengths. So here, so for example, here in um, in the photosphere, you see uh, sunspots, right? If you go even higher resolution, then you see granules. Right, the, the, the plasma parcels which are coming. In. If you do Doppler shift of that, then you'll see blue shift, and then that's it, and so on. Certain process. If you go, for example, this is H alpha, which is chromosphere. You see uh, these bright regions, which are called in plas. Uh, we are all jargons. I mean, that's why it didn't, I try to avoid as much jargons as possible. Uh, and then you have these filaments in the dark regions here. Uh, you also see sunspots. It's a tiny deal with pretty small images. We saw seeing the sunspot region. When you go up into the transition region, then uh, you see loop-like structures, which are cooler loops about, about uh, half a million or a million degree. But what you also see, the foot points are really hot loops. So if, if there are loops around these temperatures, then the foot points of those you see at these, uh, these wavelengths, right? So there are many, many, many structures. I mean, the zoo of structures which you can, which you can point to. But they don't have any meaning, it's just a name, right? Unless you understand the science of it. Okay, yeah. So, sir, uh, there are certain different densities in the chromosphere. So, similar pattern is observed in the pressure system. Yeah. So, is it uh, shock waves or what is it? There are a lot of shock waves in the chromosphere, yes. Even in the chromosphere. So, they develop in the surface Yeah. And people have measured actually soft waves. If you, what you, if you look at the, the intensity profiles, you start seeing the sharp loop patterns. Right? So you people have done this and, and very nicely and clear. I think you have some papers with Gilgis, right? So mm -hmm. since you nicely asked the question, so in the chromosphere actually you see, you see a lot of shocks. So the chromospheric heating is primarily driven by the shock waves because mm -hmm. there's a lot of sound waves are generated. Mm -hmm. Even if you do not have magnetic waves. The sound wave that you rightly pointed out, since the density is dropping drastically, suddenly you know the amplitude will grow. So the sound waves will, as it happens in the nature as well. Right? So uh, 
there it will be shock. And the shock is very easy to dissipate. And that comes energy in the thermostat. So this chromosomic temperature maintaining at that, high, at that particular value is not because of the shock waves. That complements the earlier question. Yeah. So this wave heating uh, signatures is different lights, different heights. Yes, How complete is the mapping? Does it ask <laughs> in house, in house yeah, expertise. It's uh, it all depends on what all the instruments you have. So, yeah. uh, as we have more spectrometers, they have better coverages. So, same, uh, you know, it's hard to cover all the wavelengths. Either you focus on the UV region or you focus on the region and so on. Now, we get the next Japanese uh, satellite. Yeah, EVS, yeah. yeah, so that is trying to address as many lines as possible. You see, news. Yeah, news is uh, so news is a uh, multi slit system. So, it, yeah, so it's not uh, scanning, which will take a long time, but you are using four or eight splits at the same time. They're covering the whole range. You're trying to look at the different kind of structures. So, that is going to be kind of milestone. And what does the rollout do? Maybe there are planets. Yeah, stars. Yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah, yeah. So has planet 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 discovered planets, comets. Yeah. So many comets. Yeah. All of the planets. Huh? Is there star background? Which is yeah. the background? Oh, these are stars. Stars and all. Yeah, yeah. It's a star background. It's in Milky Way with the hidden star. Yes. Yes. That's a big one. That's what I'm saying. Yeah, we struggle with a lot. It's all the solar system. It's all noise for us. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> for the stellar system, it's, it's a signal. Yeah, yeah. yeah for us, it's a signal for our youthful knowledge. Yeah. So, give us the image and we'll leave it. Take it, it's all available. Yeah. 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 Which one? Yeah. Which one? Yeah. 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 You don't need to. I mean, if you want, you can you can use later on spectra. I mean, you can, you can use filters to take a spectrum and things like that. But uh, I mean, the moon doesn't have any filter, right? So, filter. Opportunity is a block. Yeah, opportunity only block the light. Not choose the wavelength for that. No. If you want to use the main filter, if you want to so, since you asked the question, so after the upper yeah. uh, set, yeah. it depends on what you want. If you want to just image in a quiet light, but again, the question is if your sensor you pointed out, if your sensor uh, you want to just uh, observe the white light image in a, in a sort of in some pass back, then you put a filter. And that filter will have 10 angstrom, 5 angstrom, or 100 angstrom. It depends on your, your wish. But if you really want to do uh, you know, spectroscopy, you can also do that. And you put a gritty. Then you, that's what we are going to do in the VR. Right? If you have, um, um, if you're worried about sensor getting saturated, then you can put a cut down filter. Yeah. As so 100 photons are coming, you only want five. Okay. So you chop it off. That is the problem. We have far too many photons. Than, uh, each yeah. <laughs> yes. So let's say this is an open field and the direction of the field is like this, right? And you have a closed field which is like this, right? So if this direction is like that and I get a direction of topology which is like this, then the direction here is opposite. So this will current uh, create a uh, current sheet, okay? J cross B. Right. So uh, this direction and this this direction. Now this it can reconnect from a small loop and this will open. This is happening more on on a local time scale. Local what time. You are telling you not, don't get confused with the north pole south pole. That's a global time. Scale. Oh, that's a global so time. Scale. So the polarity reversal happens for completely different people. Yeah, yeah. Not for, not for this. I heard you said not pull out for it. So, ah, okay. so that because yeah. she's from Addy Beach, you know. Ah. Uh, so she's hearing about uh, polarity reversal. Yeah. Working with Vidya. Yeah. Working with Vidya. Yeah. 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 Y
Okay, okay. But she's there, so she can be here. Yeah, be there sometimes. Yeah. So from this, this image, got to like you straight dynamics or what dynamics? Yeah, yeah. So you can study a lot of things. You can study comets also, but one of the important thing is like these eruptions you see, no? So these uh, eruptions, they are uh, charged particles with uh, magnetic field. Yeah. So what you want to do is that these eruptions, when they come and hit the Earth's magnetosphere, and if the polarity is right, they would uh, reconnect with the directly with the Earth's magnetic field and dump in all the charged particles, right? Yeah. So from these structures, what like what? So you want to track these features and look at their speed spikes. He's avoiding the terminology. Seems these are the seems. I don't want, I don't really like using so, uh, you know, <laughs> no, no, so, yeah. you can look at the mass, how much mass it has. You have taught them really well. I Oh, waves and flows. Like I don't know. You should ask them. Uh, the thing is that uh, the flows and uh, waves, the observational signatures can be very, very similar. And it's very difficult to disentangle them. Um, I think one way is to, I was thinking about it at one point, that if you find in a spectroscopic observation, if you find a structure and track it from the limb to limb, right? Then the wave and the flows, because the flows would have line of sight flows, at the limb you should not be observing it. And as and when it is changing towards the other limb, you should see a consistent pattern. Whereas wave, would not have that pattern, right? Because wave doesn't care about a line of sight, right? The problem is that finding such an observation. Secondly, the structure you are observing is not the same structure. That is also evolving with time. So you don't really know if the waves you're observing at the limb is the same wave or the same structure you're observing at the other limb, right? Which could have a very different orientation, but because of the line of sight integration, you're finding it completely different. So it's a it's a kind of a gray zone where you can spend a lot of time, but so far it's very difficult. Maybe from simulations, if you can, uh, because there you can track the same structure if you want to. And, and. I mean, it's even hard I, uh, in simulation because uh, as far as we know that uh, uh, it doesn't matter what sort of wave simulation you do, there are always some flows associated with it. The reason is simple, there are non degenerative Whenever you have non degenerative you have flows associated. So I don't know how will you distinguish and that alone even difficult. So yeah, but what you are talking about is can be done large scale flows and waves, but uh, are they to do they coexist or not? And I think you can read paper by E.K. B. Motor, Tom, when we a long time back, they have also given a similar, similar type of idea. What they were saying, uh, yeah. So in that sense, people are uh, they are they are doing this thing by solar orbiter by uh, looking at the same feature from two different vantage points, solar orbiter as well as from let's say from iris or eyes or some other object. With that, you can probably distinguish, but I think they probably coexist because wherever you have waves, you have non linearity there will be flows associated with it. And I think all the simulations are suggesting the same thing. See, and also waves, they are dissipating energy, right? And that is happening all the time, right? And dissipating energy means that they're going towards the common sphere and the common sphere is operating, so you're always close, right? So, so the signatures are always mixed. In Corona loops, yeah. of course, we do, yeah, of course. So, so okay. So the energy content in these flows, which can contribute to coronal heating, is very tiny. It's very tiny. So again, the relative contribution. What you are asking, yeah. so there are been some or by any care of that, that is, uh, was mentioning 
So you expect that the flows will reach up to certain height. Their contribution will reduce further and further. So when you go, go to very high height, so we try to show it, I mean, we have also done the uh, work, that if you have very extended formal loops, so you look at it, the extended part of the loop, then you will see that the, you know, signature of the, you know, flows are less, and the waves are actually primarily carried there. But uh, lower heights, it's very difficult to determine. That's a good question. Uh, when we talk about energy being transferred uh, through the corona with waves and shock waves, and do we have uh, information about what class of waves it could be or what kind of shock waves? Kind of shock waves, I'm not sure, but we do know that uh, uh, what kind of waves it could be because theoretically wave physics is very well established. So you know how many modes you can generate in a magnetic field, for example, if the gas is there, the fast mode waves and slow mode waves and, and uh, alternate mode. Uh, there have been a lot of observations and, and the leader is here who has looked at uh, all these slow mode waves going into the corona, how much energy they are carrying. We have done some work where you start seeing interference in these different slow modes and you start seeing the beat patterns, all this physics you can, you can do all that. Um, so that is established. But what we find is the energy contained in these slow mode waves is not as much. To, to release that much energy, what you see in the in the in the corona. So, wave physics is very well established. The idea is that how actually you detect that. Alphanic mode because the, it's difficult to observe because the wavelengths are really large, and there are other complications related to that and how it should be observed. So. Is there any relation between the wave I, yeah, so basically you have to understand that if it's in a pure non-magnetic environment, when it, there is a sound wave, we call about shocks. But in the presence of magnetic uh, field also, you can have magnetic acoustic shocks. They're much more difficult to study and so on. But what he was referring to is, depending on the geometry of the magnetic field, what you consider, you will get different wave modes. If you have a uniform field and all that, you talk about the slow modes and, and the fast modes. But again, slow modes and fast modes are all, uh, you know, sort of defined with respect to the sound speed in that particular medium. So, again, if the sound speed again becomes that the wave becomes non-linear and so on, so forth, they will form uh, shocks. But they are not linear uh, phenomena again. You know? There is a, these are all non-linear phenomena. And in the presence of magnetic field, magnetic acoustic shock, there are secondary shocks. It's a three D geometry. There are lots of more complications. So we don't. Really uh, talk about uh, you know magnetic acoustic uh, you know shocks that much because there are other ways also you can dissipate a magnetic field. Let's put on in the clock shelf. There are other things. There are other mechanisms what we know today. Uh, it's easier to uh, you know dissipate for magnetic fields. Yeah. Of so they call it, they started calling it as a alpha mode. These are like alpha, 
But uh, we know that these are not exactly air spent mode because uh, these are uh, nearly compressive but not purely compressive. Yeah. The pink mode came because of the symmetrical geometry. And uh, people initially thought that these coronal loops have like a symmetrical geometry. And it indeed could explain a lot of uh, observational features like wave speeds and other things. So that's where the terminology is. Uh, so I think uh, uh, there are some group of people with, who use pink uh, waves, uh, some group of people who say that these are alphanic waves, and there are some group of people, uh, including me, who used to call them as transverse waves. But that is also not true. These waves are also not purely transverse. There are always longitudinal, some sort of longitudinal flows associated with it, as I was talking to him. I mean, that you see in simulation, they are very, uh, very small. It's not easy to identify them in the images. But uh, the problem is that you are, uh, uh, you are, uh, uh, I mean, we are used to this textbook, uh, 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 textbook uh, demarcation, like elf and wave, slow wave, faster. But uh, I mean, uh, the, in solar atmosphere, the textbook demarcation goes away because there is no homogeneous plasma. There are inhomogeneities in the plasma, and that leads to all these things. To me, the, uh, both of them are same. Both of them are same. I don't think it's a wonder what you're talking about. <laughs> so, so, you see, yeah, all these terminologies come because. See, as I was mentioning on the geometry, see, mathematical uh, construction is required. And to solve certain things, you have to have some simplicity. So, cylinder is a simple geometry which you can take. If you take it in spherical system, some other, you know, equations will come. If you take a Cartesian geometry, other equations will come and the terminology will come. So, the slow, fast and all that, you know, people have done it in the polar geometry and so on. But uniform stuff. So, uh, just a question of reinterpretation, but then again, of course, controversy comes because if the observer will say there's no cylinder in the, uh, in the sun. So obviously, then the names doesn't make any sense. <laughs> For me, they're only important if they produce enough observational signature that I can see directly. Yeah. They're important for teaching the corona. Otherwise, I don't care. So what the other term he was using was, you see, compressibility. Yes. Compressibility is required. If it is a compressible, then uh, there are certain ways you can dissipate the wave. If it is incompressible, then it is more difficult. Mm -hmm. Compressible sound is a compressible phase, right? So you can form a shock if you have a compressible phase. If it is incompressible, then it is harder to dissipate them. So as the Vigesh uh, pointed out, we need to uh, dissipate the wave to get that energy to heat the curve. So uh, that way, you know, you invoke a certain geometry and certain description which matches with the operation. Real testing operation. Real testing Real operation. operation. <laughs> Theoreticians will see anything. <laughs> Yeah, so <laughs> when you observe certain Planet. things, you are observing certain Planet. properties. If your uh, spectroscopic observation or imaging observation is supporting that you are uh, seeing a you know, signature of a transverse, as you were mentioning before. As again, it is a wave is a transverse, means you know, your things are like this sideways. And the compression, you have alternate static and coming very fashion. So these reflect in the form of a spectral observation. If you observe something, you will say that I am seeing this kind of particular wave. But as you pointed out, sun has everything. So it depends on where you are looking at, you will find something. And you interpret it that, you know, preference, whatever you have, you interpret it that. Because it matches your approach. Okay. Very basic question. I thought it was orange. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you can try hard. Yeah. <laughs> 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 
Okay, okay, I guess you guys have to attend another session, right? After this. Yes. Uh, so that's not uh, uh, for the oh, they have a, uh, spread it. Yeah. So again, uh, thank you, Durgesh, for. Uh, uh, thank you. A lot of questions and interesting sort of things. Yeah, yeah, that's good. <laughs> yeah. Can I part with yourself? Yeah. Huh? The program you have a break now or continue us? Oh, All the best. <laughs> Yeah. Uh -huh.